Thanks okay. for having me. Yeah, no, delighted and honored to have you. Thank you for making the trip. So um, there are so many places and so many topics we're going to could cover, but you know, you've been historically referred to as the both political, intellectual, maybe even spiritual leader of the Republican Party. The bar is pretty low. Yeah. So, you know, it's... <laughs> and so that leads to my question. <laughs> um, you know, the party seems to be in a different place than when you got into it. And uh, why is that? What's going to happen? What the hell is wrong with the Republican Party in the US and, uh, and perhaps politics more broadly? How much time do you have? <laughs> What's the, uh, well, I'll Wait. give you a two word answer, Donald Trump. Um, look, uh, we, so th what you just said to describe me, I mean, I'll discount it by a bit. That's true maybe, you know, six, eight years ago. Um, we were losing elections. Uh, Mitt and I lost in 2012. Our base uh, and we thought we were going to win. We didn't win. And, um, and so I think the, the Republican base said, we need just a fighter. We need an apex predator. We need a velocity. We need somebody who's just going to smash everything and disrupt. And 16, you know, 15 of the 16 people that ran for president, I thought would probably make a decent president. Mm. Donald Trump was the 16th yeah. person in the race in 2016. And he, he bested great political adversaries, people who, you know, Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio, g good sure. political, you know, people. Uh, and, he, and he won the White House. Uh, he was surprised the night he won the White House. I was surprised the night he won. We, all, we were all surprised. And, and we ran Congress for two years when I was speaker on a very specific agenda that we had crafted and, and ran on. And it worked pretty well for a couple of years. But when that agenda was done, and actually, actually we implemented all but one big piece of it, the health care bill, uh, he, just went, he just turned to populism. Hmm. And so we, are un, we have populism that has pervaded our party, that has taken over um, a big chunk, not all, but a big chunk of our party. It's what we, you think of as the Republican Party now. It's populism untethered to principle wrapped around the cult of personality of Donald Trump. Mm. This is not a populism that is, that is anchored in some kind of core philosophy other than you know, his personality. Mm. And so that's, that's a bad place to be right now. It's not a successful governing mandate. If it's what we run on this time around, I think we're gonna lose again. Uh, so to me, the, the sooner we can get past this, the better we're going to be. And I'm all for populism. I want to make you know, my ideas popular, but I want them to be tied to a principle. I want them to solve problems sure. and not to be wrapped around some guy's personality, which is screwed up as, as his is. It's not a good personality to wrap yourselves around. Right. And, and how do you see it playing out? Uh, one of two things is going to happen. One of three things. One, it, half, half my party doesn't want him to be the nominee. Half does. Um, a third. Uh, a little more than half of the half that want him really want Trump and are only going to take Trump, MAGA. But a lot of those people who are MAGA are willing to look at somebody else if that is better likely to lead to victory. Mm -hmm. So if you, there's a bunch of numbers that back up what I'm going to say. A, a plurality of Republicans want to win, think we can win with somebody else, and are willing to look at somebody other than Donald Trump. So the question is, can we narrow the field down quickly enough in time for someone else to snatch the nomination? Or are six people going to stay in the race, slice up that non-Trump vote, Trump wins because he has his you know, 40% or whatever right. it's going to be at the time. Right. So uh, Nikki Haley's probably the best bet. It's, hmm. he, it'd be between Nikki and Ron, I would say, DeSantis. Hmm. And um, so we could beat him in the primary. That's still possible. There's a huge effort underway to try and consolidate the field and get behind somebody. Two, he gets the nomination. I still think beat him, Biden beats him again, unless Biden has some really weird senior moment in October of 2024. <laughs> That's possible, but uh, Biden beats him again because the suburban voter, even more so than 2020 when they voted against him, likes him even less now, wow. January 6th and the rest. So we probably lose with him. What, what bothers me the most about it all is not only losing, but He'll take, he'll take congressional seats with him like he did the last time. He cost us the House in 18. He cost us the Senate in 20. He cost us the Senate again in 2022. So the argument people, you may know, he and I don't get along very well. I think maybe that, that's probably become kind of clear. Um, 
I don't want anything in politics. I've been there, done that. So I'm, I don't have ambition in front of me, and therefore I'm not afraid to, to criticize him because everybody who does have ambition in politics is afraid to criticize him because, you know, he's like the eye of Sauron looking for a sense around the country hitting, you know, the Republicans trying to hurt their ambition. Hmm. If, it's like a Don Corleone thing. Um, wow. There are enough of us who just want our party to win and want a person worthy of the presidency to take the White House and then help us win congressional seats, and he's not that guy. Right. Um, we should be able to win the Senate. Uh, I'm a Republican. And we should be able to win the Senate with because of the map, but he could easily cost us the House again. We're on the bubble in the House. Hmm. He cost us probably 10 to 15 seats in 2022. Uh, he cost us five seats in the Senate in 2022. So if we get past him, we're going to have a good, good November 2024. If we don't, my guess is Biden wins again, hmm. um, unless Biden, you know, really has a bad moment. Interesting. And I mean, the other interesting piece I want to ask you about was we just had a resolution on the U.S. Speaker of the House yeah. with um, obviously the appointment of Mike Johnson. And it, it seems like he was elected in a very similar way yeah. as a consensus candidate to the way you came into it, right? Mm -hmm. Like with some Catholic guilt and all yeah. the rest. <laughs> yeah, he's a Southern Baptist, but same kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, the thing about Mike, like I had, nobody hates him. <laughs> so A, that checks the key box. Uh, B, uh, Mike is a very sharp guy, uh, constitutional lawyer. What matters most, in my opinion, he's got a good even temperament. Yeah. You've got to have kind of a cool temperament. He can't be hot and cold. Um, uh, it, it didn't take three weeks. That, that's what sort of happened was Boehner was kind of pushed out by the Freedom Caucus. Kevin McCarthy was the next guy in line. He didn't have the votes, so it came to me, who I was chair of the Ways and Means Committee at the time, to be the consensus choice. And I went home for the weekend because uh, I did not want the job. I was happy where I was. Um, I'm a Catholic. John Boehner is a Catholic. The bishop in, in my congressional district, I'm from Wisconsin. So I'm like literally a 40-minute flight west of here hmm. where I'm from. And our bishop was Tim Dolan, who then moved to New York and became the Cardinal of New York. He's, he's a, the highest ranking guy in the Catholic Church in New York. So. Boehner has the bright idea, the weekend I go home to talk to my wife about whether I should do this or not, to call Tim Dolan, to call me and, <laughs> and use Catholic guilt on me <laughs> to do the job. Long story short, it worked. Uh, and it became clear as I just read the tea leaves that there was nobody else who had the consensus to get the vote to do it. So I did the job. I did it joyfully, happily, did it for two terms, um, and then realized you know, kids were in high school, the rest, the right time to do it two terms and leave. That's what I did. I think Mike Johnson's in a similar situation. It took three weeks to get to Mike Johnson, though. Three other people tried in the meantime, and it proved that, especially in the tight majority, they had to find somebody that they thought was competent uh, and that, that every facet of the conference could support. And it took three weeks to find Mike Johnson. Hmm. Um, he's... He's got the right tools to do the job. He's, I was in my ninth term when I did it, so uh, he's in his fourth. And there is a bit of a difference. Being yeah. in year six versus, you know, year 16, yeah. uh, it's a bit of a difference. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But the Catholic guilt, I was referring to you, and the reason that came to mind was I was telling my mother, um, who I was interviewing today, and she didn't really know or care about anybody, but she, you know, stuck with you. And she said, of all your achievements, she looked on Wikipedia, she says, you know, um, his DNA tests showed that he's 3% oh, yeah. Ashkenazi yeah. Jewish. I know. And I, I, I told true. her, I said, that's probably the right amount, because if he had any more, uh, I'd be sitting in his seat, and he'd be sitting in mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, yeah, on my mother's side, I might add. On your mother's I'm, side. I'm, I'm, it's on my it's mother's like side. like legit. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So OK, um, coming back <laughs> to the real world. Um, so we just averted a government shutdown, and there's, there's another one looming mid-November. Uh, and you told me stories about your involvement, uh, sort of averting previous government shutdowns. A lot of these. Yeah. Maybe you could share uh, one or two of those just to help people understand exactly what's happening behind the scenes yeah. and whether you think there's any legitimate reason for concern. Oh, yeah, there's that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but remember, this isn't a debt default. I try to tell, you know, especially the bond market people and everything, this is not a debt default. This is just some of government shutting down for a period of time. Not even what we call mandatory spending, like all those transfer payments for Medicare and Social Security. All that continues on. So it's a fraction of government that stops. So just, I try to tell that to people who are watching markets. Um, I think the best parallel 
uh, to government shutdowns of the current variety we have is the politics around it. In 2013, um, after we had lost to Obama in, in 2012 election, after Obamacare was passed into law, we had a brand new guy come to the Senate uh, named Ted Cruz. You probably know who he is. And Ted, um, the Senate was in the minority. We in the House were in the majority. Ted was running TV ads uh, saying the House can defund Obamacare. It's within their control to get rid of the Affordable Care Act and defund Obamacare. Because that was, we wanted to get rid of Obamacare and replace it with something else. And he kept running these ads and making this argument and getting House Republicans to stand up and fight and stop Obamacare, which, by the way, this is discretionary spending, government shutdowns. Obamacare is not discretionary spending. It's, it's what we call mandatory program. It's automatic spending, permanent law, like Social Security. So when the government shuts down, it keeps going. It continues unabated. Hmm. And so he was, he was perpetuating this myth. And I was the budget director, or the budget chair at the time, and John Boehner, the speaker, asked me, he's like, all these guys in the Freedom Caucus are following Ted Cruz you know, you know, echoing this thing that, that we in the House could just unilaterally stop Obamacare if, if we just hold tight. Would you please talk to these guys and explain to them? I'm like, yeah, sh okay, sure. So I went and met with all these guys, talked to, to their then leader. I won't say his name because you all know who he is. And um, saying, wait, you don't understand this is not shutting down Obamacare. That's a permanent program, entitlement spending. That what we're talking about is discretionary government agencies' right. budgets. It doesn't, Ted's not telling the truth. You know this. Oh, yeah, yeah, we got that. Like, so you know Ted's full of you know what, and, <laughs> and that this won't stop Obamacare, right? Yes, got it. Oh, good. So we're not going to shut the government down, right? We're not going like, to make ourselves look like fools. You know, these guys in the Senate aren't even in the majority. We're going to keep funding government. He's like, oh, no, we can't vote for that. <laughs> like, well, wait, you just told me you know it doesn't do what they're saying it does. Why can't you vote for it? He's like, well, because Ted redefined what it is to be against Obamacare. Mm -hmm. So we got to vote to shut the government down. And I said, knowing it doesn't stop Obamacare, yes, because he has redefined what it is wow. in, among our base, on cable television and the rest. Uh, I said, well, what, what, why don't you just go home and explain it? <laughs> you know, you go to your editorial boards, do some TV interviews. Like, you know, oh, we, we can't do that. It's too late. Too late for that. So I went back to Boehner's office. I'm like, you are screwed. <laughs> you know, we're going to have a government shutdown that lasted 16 days. That's the kind of politics we have right now. It's irrational. It's what I call entertainers versus legislators, performance artists versus, you know, people who negotiate and compromise and get things done. And that's where we are right now. I'm hoping that Mike Johnson is given... Um, a lot of deference because he just got the job. He's got new challenges. Everybody knows he's got a really steep learning curve and that they cut him some slack and let him get through this moment. I, I assume he'll get a continuing resolution passed November 17th. So he's not going to be able to build the appropriations process in a few weeks. So I, my guess is he'll delay a shutdown to wherever the end of that continuing resolution is. It could be December. It could be January, February. It depends on what the Senate accepts. Right, right. And then you'll have your government shut down. And my guess is you probably will, because unless they give Mike enough deference and Mike is willing to, you know, bring bills to the floor that the, that the hard right won't like, but get them passed anyway, he will have to expend an enormous amount of personal political capital to do that. And um, he's new in the job, so we'll see, you know, how much of that capital he's got. Hmm. I, I do want to go back to your comments on Trump for a second. Uh, I don't want to belabor the point, but you had to work with him. I, I know you were a big proponent of the free trade agreement. Yeah. And I think uh, Trump was obviously, and this is quite important to us. Yeah, uh, sure. I understand at the time, Trump was kind of determined to pull out of NAFTA. Uh, he he yeah. was going to do it on one day, actually, yeah. Yeah, so how, I yeah. mean, you had to work through that to preventing him from doing that. Like, how, how did that... A uh, little story unfolded. Yeah, his chief of staff then was a friend of mine from Wisconsin named Reince Priebus, and he told me he just wrote a letter and he's going to go announce that he's pulling out a NAFTA. I'm like, wait, 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 what? <laughs> <laughs> like, he, he, it doesn't really work like that mechanically, but he was going to do it. So I had to get on the phone and tell him he was going to crash the stock market uh, if he did this. Uh, and, and that kind of rattled him. And while I was talking to him, Gary Cohn, his NEC director, literally went to his desk and grabbed the letter and took it. 
Wow. <laughs> it's, it's fast. <laughs> and then we talked him out of it uh, for the moment. It, that was a typical day. Right. Uh, <laughs> so we say, I mean, I'm, I, I wish I was joking. Um, that was a typical day. So I basically, and then we had Sonny Purdue come in, who's, who was the ag secretary, and explain how it was just going to crash. I mean, I'm from Wisconsin, so I can talk dairy, softwood, lumber, all that stuff. I, and I, Ways and Means Committee is in charge of trade, so I spent my life in trade policy. Right. Yeah. So I, I explained to him just all the parade of horribles that were about to fall if he just went out and did this. Um, and then they negotiated the USMCA, which is basically TPP, but just for our continents. It's, we took off, I, I helped put the TPP together, which is a great, you're in TPP, I wish we were. Um, it's with, and just with a little bit of dairy and auto on top. And, right, you know, right. and, and later a little bit of softwood lumber policy, that's basically USMCA. Um, with, with a sunset, which I wish we didn't have. I was against this sunset, but I'm not too stressed about that. I mean, listen, you gotta give it to the guy, his creative marketing abilities. I mean, I think you worked with him on a tax bill. He had a yeah. name for that that I think we... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, he does have a great marketing. That, and he basically wanted to redo, get rid, say he got rid of NAFTA. And, and it needed to be updated anyway because of all the, the new economy. On the tax law, that was my thing. Um, I had actually prepared that when I was chairman of the committee and my successor, um, a, a guy named Kevin Brady, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee that replaced me in that committee when I became speaker. We wrote the new law, the 2017 Tax, tax Cuts. We call it the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Kind of a pedantic, boring name. But it was that or what Trump wanted, which was the Cut, Cut, Cut Act. <laughs> that was, <laughs> and, and he got Kevin Brady to, like, he just, he's good at wearing people down, and he got Kevin Brady in the Oval Office to basically agree to this, and Kevin texted me, like, you need to call into the, White House, into the Oval Office right now. I'm like, I'm in a meeting, I'm busy. He's like, please call now. <laughs> so I called in there, and they put me on speaker, and Trump's like, we're gonna call it the Cut, Cut, Cut. I'm like, there's no way we're gonna call this the Cut, Cut, Cut Act. We went back and forth and back and forth because I was the one who was willing to, like, because I didn't yeah. care, you know? And we finally called it the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, but he just, you know, it's just a constant. Sometimes his marketing is brilliant, frankly. You know, he just has a six, he's a promoter. He's, right, he's got right. a sixth sense for this thing, but sometimes it's, yeah, it's a little less than brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So just, I mean, you've had interactions with many political leaders, um, and uh, I'm sure some of you have admired. Like, who had the biggest impact on your life, and what stories stick out uh, most from your time in office? And then we'll get to the economy and what you're doing and so many uh, things. When my dad died when I was a kid, so I always had mentors. I always looked up to people to aspire to, you know, try and grab some of their attributes and learn from them. I'd say Jack Kemp. I don't know if people in this room would know who Jack Kemp was. Jack Kemp, um, actually he was a quarterback for the Buffalo Bills, so I think some Canadians know who he <laughs> yeah. was. Um, but he was a congressman for 18 years. Um, the leading supply cider in Congress, who basically wrote Reaganomics. And so an economic force, uh, I was his staff economist out of co after college, and he's the guy who talked me into public service as a vocation, and, and he convinced me to go home at 27 years old and run for Congress. Uh, Jack was Bob Dole's running mate in, two, in 1996. They didn't win that. And so he was the guy who sort of proselytized free markets, poverty policy and, 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 and bringing, I had a Democrat district, so I had to go as a, as a free market conservative home to Wisconsin hmm. in a Democrat district and, and try and survive. And I ended up winning by 15 points against a very, very good you know, candidate um, because I basically took the Jack Kemp message, the Jack Kemp you know, vision, uh, an infectious enthusiasm, Reagan optimistic, Reaganite type of message. Um, with conservative policies. Hmm. Uh, and so Jack was my big mentor. Um, so he was really the one that, that, that affected me the most. The second part of your... Yeah, I was just asking about stories that are most memorable from your time in office, anything oh, that wow. sticks out that uh, may be interesting to family office crowd. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the stories of making laws are kind of boring compared to like the last four years, you know, um, when I was speaker. I did two, a term with Obama and a term with Trump. Obama, we got less done, but it was easier. <laughs> Meaning, I mean, you know, he and I got along fine. We, we, we had respect for each other. We, we knew where we were gonna disagree, where we would agree, then we'd work and, and find the Venn diagram, get it done. It was pretty simple. Trump, we got a lot done. It was actually the most productive session of Congress since Reagan's first term in 81. 
um, but it was it was a wild ride, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because to get him to, to to stay on a position was almost impossible. Because whoever the last person that spoke to him, who you know, fed his narcissism, kind of won the argument and got him to change his mind. Mm. So, I guess the best anecdote was I learned about this. I, I had talked to people who sort of knew him, studied him, gave me those kinds of warnings. So the guy, you know, was in real estate his whole life. He'd been building buildings. So I figured, well, I'll just put together a giant Gantt chart for him. And I had a Gantt chart. It was literally like four feet by like mm. five feet. And I did it with McConnell. Here's this massive agenda that we ran on that you agreed you'd support our agenda if, if we all won. Um, and that the Federalist Society would give you a list of judges to pick from. Here is what Congress, here's how we get all of these policies into law over two years. Here's what the House does, here's what the Senate does, the committee, just a, the, a very good Gantt chart. And I said, this will consume us for the next two years. So if you agree to this plan, we will produce a really good plan to get all these things done faster than had been done in, you know, in, in our lifetimes. Uh, my life, he's a pretty old guy. <laughs> and, and, um, and this will take us the next two years. I just wanted to fill the void with just this agenda. And he agreed to it. And he said, just, I want more infrastructure, kind of like more cowbell, you know, mm -hmm. just more infrastructure. So we put, you know, FAA, redesigned the FAA. We did some, you know, other waters, you know, waterways. So I ran Congress for two years off this Gantt chart. And every time he went off on some weird tangent, wanting to do some crazy thing because somebody ticked him off on TV, which happened every day, <laughs> um, uh, I'd say, hey, remember, we got a plan. We got this Gantt chart. That's not part of the plan. You know, you know going after this guy's, pro that, that, that's not the plan. We got this plan, and, and it worked, basically. Yeah. We just, we were able to get him. Kept bringing him back. Yeah, yeah. and it was, in, at the end of the day, he would do such weird stuff that freaked people out that when we conservatives brought these normal bills to the floor, like, Op like lifting the ban on exporting crude oil, um, opening up our energy markets, you know, tax reform. They're like, oh, that's just you guys being normal Republicans, whatever. <laughs> Donald Trump said the craziest thing on Twitter. I'm so upset. So he sort of kind of paid, he made the outrage so much that we basically got this agenda through. Yeah, interesting. Um, and then he used his exit sketch, you know, signature and, <laughs> you know, and signed, signed, you know, a lot of bills. We passed about 700 bills into law. Incredible. Which is a that, pretty that, good clip. That is wild. Um, I, I wanna, I'm gonna throw a little um, a landmine into the conversation. Okay. And um, I resisted raising this question all day because frankly, um, but I think you're maybe the, the most relevant person to whom I could address this, which is, you know, what are your views on what's actually happening in the Middle East right now? And how do you envision the end game there? My worry right now is, is Biden and Blinken try to curtail BB and Gantz and the government from doing what they need to do to secure themselves. They have to finish off Hamas. Just no two ways about it. Um, and we will, there's a little skirmish about, you know, funding that we will give Israel what they need. We will, th this will happen. That's going to happen. We'll give them all the JDAMs, all the harpoons, all the Iron Dome resupply. We'll give them everything they need. That's going to happen. Do not doubt that for a second. Um, yeah, we, we got, I've been there many times. I was in Gaza in 05, the week Ariel Sharon pulled out. Um, saw them pulling settlers out. Uh, then went and had lunch with Ariel Sharon. I forgot who it was. Some guy passed this, I forgot what he called these things, this resolution basically condemning he and his descendants for a thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so he was really dejected at that time. And he made this bet. It was the wrong bet. He made this bet. I remember Natan Sharansky was telling us, this isn't going to work out right uh, at the hmm. time. And he made a bet giving them a free space, Gaza, to self-govern shows that we really, really tried. Well, that blew up in, our, in, in all of our faces. Um, and so I think this ends, I, I, it's hard to imagine Hezbollah not getting pulled into this. I know the mullahs probably, they probably want that, but I don't think Hezbollah wants that, is be, be my guess, just mm -hmm. from all the intelligence reports I've read over the years on this. Um, but I, I have a hard time seeing this not opening up on a couple more fronts. Um, you, we have to, that's why we have two carrier groups there. That's, we have to plan for this. Um, but I think 
we need to give the Israelis all the breathing space and all the political cover they need to, to, do, to, to get, finish off Hamas. There's just no two ways about it. Hmm. And then we need to really help them. If it, you know, West Bank and, and the North, I've been to all of these places. I mean, Hezbollah is much, much tougher than Hamas. So I, I just right? think he had to plan for that. Hmm. And I think that that's possible. But I think um, it all goes down to, it goes back to Iran. So I think we have to play an important role of deterrence in there. And, if, and, and, and we, we shouldn't just hit a couple ammo factories. So I'm a little hawkish on this particular issue. Um, but uh, hmm. uh, no. what freaks me out, I, mean, I don't mean to riff on this, is um, our college campuses. It's the craziest. I, did, I frankly didn't see that coming. The anti-Semitism that you're seeing not, I, I mean, I get it in Europe and around the world that we've seen that before. Yeah. But this BDS, you know, this funding, this stuff has been planted for a while. And there are sovereigns giving money to these groups in, hmm. in, 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 in both our countries. But that's, that's a little unnerving to me. Yeah. Um, but hopefully it's waking. Bob Kraft and others have, you know, funded a really interesting project. Um, I think we're going to get through this. And I think we're going to punch anti-Semitism in the mouth. Uh, and, our, and, and my party's very good on this issue, but the Democrats are having a bit of a wake-up call themselves. I think and hope at the end of this, you're going to have a stronger, more secure Israel. You're going to have a non-existent Hamas. You'll have anti-Semitism smoked out of its holes, hmm. uh, at least in country, in like North America. Um, and you'll have a degraded Iran. That's what comes out of wow. this thing. From, from your mouth to God's ears. Yeah. I, uh, that would be amazing. Um, all right, so just uh, shifting the conversation back, because you're now well out of politics, and now you're bringing your unique abilities to help companies. Maybe talk a little bit about how you're doing that before we even get into Solmer and some of the other things that you're, you're busy with. Yeah, I, when I, re I retired in 2019 after 20 years in Congress, again, as economics is my thing. I, I teach as an adjunct professor of economics at Notre Dame. And I'm a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. It's a think tank in DC on fiscal policy. Uh, but I wanted to immerse myself, have, after defending the free enterprise system in Congress for 20 years, I wanted to immerse myself inside of the free enterprise system. And so I decided I had to think about where to go. And that's why it was an easy decision. I, I decided to join as a partner at Solomir Capital Solomir, my partner Spencer Zwick is somewhere in the audience here. These lights are hard to see. Um, Solomir was founded by Mitt Romney, Tag Romney, Spencer Zwick, Eric Schuerman, and some others 16 years ago as a middle market firm um, with, with the cap table being families and entrepreneurs and founders of businesses, putting their own money in, in, the, in the, the fund, investing in businesses in a few verticals, to really help them scale and grow and to bring this network of people that could really help these businesses because they have made their money inside of these verticals. Think, you know, Bill Marriott, Marriott Hotels, hospitality. You know, Lee Scott, chairman of Walmart, you know, Walmart uh, suppliers, things like that. Sure. And what I love doing is building a macroeconomic thesis uh, where we invest and then helping these founders scale their businesses. It's a very founder-friendly firm. We don't have to buy a majority. Um, and it's long term. We're, we're long term thinking people. That to me was so much more interesting than the than the offers I had, like the big bulge bracket firms, like the Black Rocks and Blackstones and Carlisles. This to me is much more interesting, and frankly, returns I think are better in the lower and, and middle market. Sure. Um, and it's because they're they're off market deals. We don't typically do auctions. So I, I think that's super interesting. As vice chair at Taneo, I help really large businesses CEOs. Um, navigate the big complex problems that they have. And what you find out with, you know, if you're running a big company today, it's not just, you know, your debt markets and all these, you know, financial typical problems. You have to start thinking like a politician, regrettably, but mm. that's just what happens these days, whether it's ESG or what. So I actually enjoy learning about their problems and helping them sort of translate how they have to operate in my old world how you have to think like a politician these days because the, the interaction between government, culture, politics, the culture war itself and businesses are basically, there's no barrier anymore. Right. So could you maybe give a little bit of, go deeper on how you actually create value with, um, in your work with Solomare, uh, your work with, with other businesses, and maybe even um, 
Maybe an example or two would help. Okay, so um, we have a thesis that I, with our team, built that with decoupling with China that is underway, a bunch of my friends in Congress are building that, uh, and the supply chain problems we experienced in COVID left some vulnerabilities where we can't have such long supply chains, we have to shorten our supply chains. That's a long way of saying, I think North America is a good bet, Canada and US in particular, it's one of the reasons I come up here a lot now. Second is we're bringing skilled manufacturing, high skilled manufacturing back to our shores. So in looking at that, we're, we're trying to see where is a good place to, to, to make investments. A lot of that is labor. We have, the shortage we have in this is high skilled labor. So we bought um, the largest supplier of high skilled labor, a company called Integrated Power Services, um, that supplies high skilled labor on a recurring revenue basis to service company manufacturing facilities that, to maintain all their very tough equipment, their, their motors, their pumps, their drives, and it's a roll-up play. Hmm. So our value add is we help buy businesses. One of them was stuck and locked because of a company wouldn't let them buy it. I knew the company got it bought. Yeah. Another one was we wanted to be the supplier for Nucor for 10 years of this company and knew Nucor really well. It's a big uh, steel company in America. So we, we can open doors uh, at the C-suite level and make customer introductions and expand. So we're, we're, we have a master contract with Nucor now, for example, on this company. But this business, um, we've got, I don't know, four or five um, LOIs you know, under contract now. And we do, we, we do platform investments and roll-ups. Another one we bought, we, we designed a thesis with one of our um, LPs. Uh, he used to run Visa, the credit card company. And we had a theory about the disruption happening in, in PEOs, professional employer organizations. Um, not just doing payroll, but outsourcing payroll and benefits and HR and all of that. So we bought a business that we liked a lot with good technology, 10 million in EBITDA. Um, and then we went around and, and did 55 bolt-on acquisitions over four years, and now okay. it's doing, it's, we're hoping to get 365 million in EBITDA by the end of the year. Wow. So we've really grown that, so we do those kinds of things. We have a thesis, we have a network of people in our LP base that can help open doors and introduce new customers to grow that business. And then we can go out and, and buy businesses and, and, and make customer introductions and grow our EBITDA. Mm -hmm. um, and you and, mentioned earlier that you're starting to do a little bit of business on this side of the border. Yeah. Do you mind elaborating on that? Yeah, I'm excited about this. I just, again, back, to, I'm, a, I'm, I'm kind of a kissing cousin to you guys. I'm from Wisconsin. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I can canoe into your state, in your country. Um, I've been coming here catching, I call it northern, you guys call them pickerel. I've been fishing in Georgian Bay and these areas, you know, since I was a kid. So to me, it's natural uh, to come here, but I'm a big believer, in, and we have a lot of families that want to bring their businesses here, and we want to find families that want to bring their businesses to America. And we have this en enormous network of people through, between Mitt Romney and myself and our partners who have been going around America knowing, working with people in all sorts of industries and in all locations, we, want to, we think that there are a lot of interesting businesses here that could bring their, their goods and services to, 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 North, to America that we want to open those doors. And we also think that there are businesses that are mature need to grow and could come north. So because our theory is North America is going to be a good bet, unfortunately, the world is going to get uglier and bumpier with China decoupling, with, with frictions there, with supply chains coming back home, with, with frictions in the Middle East. Um, North America is going to be a safer good bet. So we want to expand um, our economic activity um, North, north, of the, north of Lake Superior, like, I like yeah. to say, <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah. Um, and, and Mexico eventually as well. I think they could stand for a better government. But if you add the whole continent, labor supply, natural resources, you know, our two oceans, the, our safety, our rule of law, um, I think it's a good bet. Yeah. And just a, um, I, I wanna, this morning I was just thinking, the, um, Jeff Ubbin was talking about the trend of decarbonizing heavily industrialized businesses. Um, and that's, uh, I guess, partly as a result of regulatory pressures. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on where politics and capital intersect more, most meaningfully in your world, and if you, maybe you're active in that space, because yeah. that seems to be a natural. Yeah, if, uh, academically, I'm, I authored a, a tax reform plan at AEI that, that has a carbon tax embedded in it. Um, to go to a, 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 a border-adjustable carbon tax, which I think is the smarter way to go. Um, it's 
any economist will tell you putting price signals on carbon through the private sector through the tax code is far better than subsidizing yesterday's technology, which is what the inflation, um, it's, it's not a reducing, it's not a inflation reduction act, it's the, it's the inflation steroids act, yeah, <laughs> if you ask me, but, um, but so that, that labor market play I told you about with IPS, what they do is they have, we have workers that are fanning across North America, we have some businesses in Canada um, that convert over to electrical. So we're helping Nucor convert all of its blast furnaces that use natural gas into electric EAR furnaces that are electrical. So we are helping high skilled manufacturing facilities electrify their, their output. So there's an example of building out capacity um, of, of a labor supply to help the conversion to electric for, for, for large manufacturing from using, which is typically, you know, natural gas or other forms of, of fossil fuel. So we're, you know, we're more of the picks and shovels investors than the actual, you know, high flying technology thing. We don't do venture capital. We don't do things with binary risk. We buy good, stable, cash generating, generating businesses um, that we think are, have good TAMs, good, good, good addressable markets in the future, because we try to skate to where the puck is going to be. And in this particular case, we know there's a lot of electri electrification that is coming to the industries. So we're betting on that labor supply of those services. Things like that are what yeah. we do. And uh, I mean, one of the things that, again, also previous conversation we had with Dr. Uh, Jim Young Kim, uh, who's also vice chairman of um, um, infrastructure uh, capital partners. Um, the, uh, the, your views on, I mean, what, one of the things he mentioned is that you're actually seeing better infrastructure in the emerging markets than we are in North America. How are you thinking about infrastructure? Is that an area of opportunity for yes. you? Yeah, we, we, we've, we've made some big bets in there as well. We bought the, we, we, it's a roll up. So we're now the largest traffic management solution business. It's called Helix Traffic Solutions. We own that, which if you look at any kind of bridge, road or airport project, invariably there's traffic being directed around it. Um, I come from this industry, my, my family business in, in road construction. The road builder doesn't do that. The road builder doesn't pay for all that infrastructure of cones and flags and signs and people. They outsource that to a traffic management solution company and that's what we bought. So again, a picks and shovels play. It's not mm -hmm. buying the road builder, it's not buying the aggregate pit, it's buying the traffic management solution business. Lots of mom and pops that we're building up together, good synergies, scale matters, better technology, um, because we believe the infrastructure, which is recession resistant, um, is here to stay. That big bill that just passed in this last session of Congress takes about 10 years to spend out uh, quite a bit of money. And I think the political consensus in, in America is finally there now where when we, and I did three trust fund bills. I, w between budget chair, ways and means chair, and speaker, um, those three people basically um, make the financing of the highway trust fund work. Hmm. So I spent a lot of my, my policy time in the guts of how the highway trust fund and the airport trust fund works. Right. Um, the airport trust fund is plussed up. That's going to be well funded because we raised the ticket tax. That's pretty simple user fee. We now finally have consensus because electric vehicles are coming on so fast that the gas tax is a total loser for a revenue source. Hmm. Um, it is a shrinking, melting ice cube. And so I believe within a handful, probably four or five years, we will have a VMT, vehicle miles travel tax that will be attached to your car. Because if wow. before it was Big Brother was going to watch where you drove, well, hell, that can happen in your phone and everywhere. So you can put guaranteed dumb technology on a vehicle. And so it doesn't matter whether it's an electric vehicle or a gas or diesel vehicle. And you tax it by its weight class and how much it uses. So it's true user fee. And then that, that, that assesses the fee. That will be a boon to our highway trust fund because our highway trust fund right now is funded on a gas tax that you cannot politically raise that gas tax. And the gas tax is a shrinking revenue pool because fewer people are using gas because they're buying electrical cars and stuff right, like that. Then right. their mileage is getting better. So I think we finally got the consensus to fix that. So I, I see more spend happening in infrastructure because of some political problems that are now becoming surmountable and because of just this recent legislation which passed in addition to the Highway Trust Fund being reauthorized. Hmm. So we're, we actually are spending more time in this area in addition to this traffic management solution business that we bought. Amazing. I, I do want to uh, come back to, you said something earlier where you said, like, look, we're in for some bumpy times. And obviously you teach economics, you've written a fair bit about it. 
when you're thinking about where the puck is going, and I would love to hear your take from a macroeconomic point of view um, in terms of what are the most salient issues that all of us as investors should be thinking about right now. Yeah, bonds. I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I spent most of my adult life um, trying to build budgets for our government to avoid a debt crisis. And from 2010 to 2018, uh, I, passed, I wrote and passed four, and my colleagues who followed me in the budget committee wrote and passed four budgets that balanced the budget and paid off the debt. Mm -hmm. We passed these out of the House. Never got the time of day in the Senate, never had a president willing to do it. But we voted to raise the retirement age. We voted to means test our entitlement programs. We voted to convert, convert Medicare into what I would call a defined contribution um, market-based delivery system program. Um, we voted to block grant Medicaid and cap its growth rate. We did all this and survived fine politically. You know, we had a lot of nasty ads run against us. We did fine. We lost because, Trump, because of Trump in 2018. So I am of the belief that if we can get our politics somewhat serious enough, because they're not serious right now, we know exactly what we need to do to dodge a debt crisis. The problem is we're starting, we're running out of road to kick the can down on this matter. Yeah. And when the, when the, when the two year is right around 5% and the long bond is, is looking, it's starting to leave the Federal Reserve. The, Federal, the, the, the long bonds are basically leaving the Fed. The Fed is rolling off its balance sheet. They're down to seven trillion from eight. They're gonna keep going down. The Treasury is pumping out about $337 billion um, dollars in, in notes and bills and bonds. And when the Treasury financed most of this debt that we now have a few years ago, they didn't do long-term bonds. They did, they, did, they did notes and bills. Mm. All that's being refinanced now, not at 1%, but at 5%. Yeah. And we're resetting our debt in a really dangerous place. So. We are beginning to run out of time and run out of room. And you compound that with the fact that we are the world's reserve currency and digitization is coming. The Chinese are digitizing their RMB and they're gonna try and hook up their client states in the Belt Road onto their digital currency, which is what I would call surveillance money. Um, I believe we don't have much time. I'm not just gonna say like single digit years, but we've, we've gotta get moving on this fast. I think a commission, a debt commission is the best way out of this. Um, I got a text from the new speaker's office this morning about how to set up a debt commission. Um, that if we get this right, and I say we, I mean, I just see us all in the same boat here together. Um, yeah. If we have a, if we digitize our money in the smart way that protects our freedom, our privacy and the rest, and we get good clean payment rails, that's a whole nother conversation. But we, we offer a 21st century version of money that works for free societies as an alternative to these other things that are coming. And America gets its debt under control, which means we're not gonna take benefits away from baby boomers. But those of us in the X generation on down are gonna have new systems that still fulfill the mission and delivery of, of the social contract, which is health and retirement security and a safety net for the poor. That's the social contract that America has with its people that both parties agree on. Right. We all agree on that. We just think that there's a better way to deliver it in the 21st century because these things were written 40, 50, 60 years ago. We know more now than we knew then on how to do it. And so I think it's politically doable. It, it's, it's, it's doable from a policy perspective. We know what we need to do to dodge a debt crisis. We will borrow a lot of money for the boomers, but after that, we can prove and demonstrate on a real-time basis on what we use accrual accounting for this we can wipe out tens of trillions of dollars of unfunded liability of debt off our books and get credit today from the bond markets to do so hmm. and stabilize our currencies, keep our bond markets in good place if we can get our political act together somewhat. Right, right. And, and I, I'm, I pray that that's sooner rather than later. I'm not a fan of either Trump or Biden as our nominees. I think both of them, the, the problem with these two guys in this particular issue is they're both promising not to touch this. Hmm. They're both saying, we're going to campaign against these guys like me who talk about entitlement reform and debt reduction and, and balancing the budget because they are from the boomer generation, which says that's a political third rail. You touch it, you die. I'm using it against my... He's running ads against Ron DeSantis right now. 
for wanting to you know, reduce the debt. Right. So you know, that's just my side of the aisle, and we're supposed to be the conservatives. So we get past these two guys, and I think we're going to have hopefully a better shot right. um, at getting this under control. And I think it's probably going to have to be a debt commission that Congress can't dodge, that ha they have to vote on, with the president you know, pulling for it, asking for it. Right. Um, well, and if we do that, then I think we're going to be in great shape. We'll dodge the bullet, we'll stay as reserve currency, and we'll be able to keep our social contract intact without having to monetize our debt. I mean, it's a big if, right? I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. a, a, we just learned in the last conversation that um, the loonies going to hell in a handbasket. So the, it's our only hope is south of the border. And at the same time with rising debt and de-dollarization that we're starting to see in other yeah, parts. Yeah, we are. You know, like it, I'm just still curious, because earlier you mentioned you're still bullish on the US. I am. Given all of these constraints, how are you maintaining that, uh, that bullish sense? How do you have that conviction? You mentioned who are like one of my mentor types. Somebody I never met, you know, Jack Kemp was my boss. Winston Churchill, I'm a huge fan of Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill said two things that really stick with me these days. Democracy is the worst possible form of government, except for all the other <laughs> forms of government. It is sloppy, it is ugly, it is messy, but it delivers. Mm. And I'll take our free society and the innovation that comes with it over, over these techno tyrannies any day. But what Churchill also said is the Americans can be counted upon to do the right thing but only after they've exhausted all the other <laughs> possibilities. <laughs> so, you know, I think we stick to landing at the end here. Um, and, and, and that's my prayer, that's my hope, and that's my faith, and I'm an, I, it's, it's nicer being, this, this bottle of water is half full, not half empty in my mind. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's just the way I like to look at these things. But again, the alternatives to a, a horrible debt crisis is, is pretty ugly. Hmm. I won't get into all the ugly budget surgery that you have to do, so that's why I think stepping in front of it you know, I think that's going to be, that's going to, it's going to, the politics is going to turn to the advantage at the end of the day on this, I think. Yeah. Okay. I hear you. I'm hopeful and optimistic. I, um, just, uh, one of the things that I guess just mentioning you kind of have this perspective, the glass, the bottle is half full, even though yours is now half empty. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, no, you, you've, you've come from, you know, you didn't grow up, uh, uh, with privilege. You really came from some humble beginnings. Um, what are some of those early stories from your childhood that sort of still inspire you and motivate you today? Uh, I remember when my dad died, I was working at McDonald's and mowing lawns at the time. And the manager at McDonald's, when I went to apply for the job, said, what would you like to do? Uh, and I said, I think I'd like to work the cash register, be in the front, interact with the customers. He's like, I don't think you got the social skills for that. <laughs> so like, put me in the quarter grill. And then I got elected to Congress. Yeah, so, um, no, but I always, you know, I mean, I, uh, and my, my grandma moved in who had Alzheimer's with my mom and myself. She went back to school, get a, we, you know, we lived on Social Security survivor benefits in those days. Um, uh, you, these things make you stronger. Adversity just makes you better and stronger and it makes you, and it makes you empathetic and makes you appreciate things. I guess the best advice I ever got was from my mom who said, you have two ears and you have one mouth, use them in that proportion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, that's always served me pretty well. I think it's one of the reasons why I got elected to the last job I had because I'd listen to people first. Um, I had strong opinions, but I wasn't gonna try and cram my view down their throat. I was gonna see where the common ground is to try and you know, make advancements. Yeah. I think that's, just, I think that's the kind of skill set you should have in the legislature. Uh, or if you're leading a large organization. Absolutely. I mean, based on your story, what you're describing is effectively people that pull themselves up by the bootstraps. And so you've always advocated for meritocracy. And at yeah. the same time, socially and culturally, when we look out in the political domain, we're seeing redistributive policies. Um, do you see a shift? Do you see a, 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 a kind of a reversion to the mean? Or? Yeah. This fight's been with us a long time. Uh, I spent my entire political career in this particular fight. Uh, the role in government, the role and goal of government for a guy like me is to promote a quality of opportunity for the left, and I don't know people's politics, but I would say the progressive left, the role and goal of government is to equalize the, the outcome of people's lives. Equal outcomes versus equal opportunities. It's a massive different kind of government between those two things, and we have this big fight over this. I really believe that there is a great moral high ground to be had by fighting for pro-growth entrepreneurial policies, equality of opportunity, 
It's why I spend my vocational time at my charitable foundation, my work at Notre Dame and AEI, building a digital safety net, building entrepreneurial ideas that, that promote upper mobility yeah. um, versus poverty policies that are designed to, 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 to basically deaden people um, and keep them stuck in their current station in life and make them you know, feel less pain. Yeah. Um, I think you, there's a moral high ground to be had. It's, it's not to be seated. And you have to believe to, to do this. And I think it's, it's, I spent a lot of my time on this. We can champion a culture of entrepreneurship and upper mobility and of achievement and take pride in that and be yeah. proud of people who achieve things. And I think that's, that, that's where the moral high ground is. The last thing I'll say is, and I, I, think, I, mean, I can't speak to, I'm not a Canadian, I can't speak to, to Canada, but I, in America, I got to know Bono real well, the, you know, the, the U2 singer. He just, he's a big foreign, pop, foreign aid guy. And, and I asked him once, like, what, what do you think makes us so unique here? I just, you know, just shooting the bull with him. He said, you know what, this is what happens. In Ireland, if you come stumbling out of the pub at the end of the night, you, you know, you had six Guinnesses, and you're looking up on the hill, you see the big mansion, the big rich guy in the house. You, you come out in Ireland, you say, one of these days, I'm going to get that guy. <laughs> he said, in America, you, you have six Guinnesses, you, you stumble out of it, and you look on the hill, and you see the mansion, you say, one of these days, I'm going to live in a house like that. Huh. That's yeah. the difference. Right. And um, in, in, in these cultural entrepreneurship societies, um, and I don't want us to become like Europe, where we have this, this zero-sum game thinking, this fixed pie thinking. Life is dynamic. There are positive sum relationships. And I do believe it's better politics. It's morally better. And I also think you can get the moral high ground, and I think you can make better arguments by talking about entrepreneurial upward mobility versus just, you know, making people stuck in their current station in life. I, I couldn't agree more. So, couldn't agree more. Yeah. I, um, uh, just in the, in the basically last couple minutes we have left, uh, I'm just going to do what I have asked a couple others on this uh, stage to do earlier, which is I'm going to throw a couple lightning round questions your way. Uh, don't overthink it. 20, 30 seconds, whatever okay. comes to mind, but be afraid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're great. <laughs> uh, okay. Favorite or current exercise regimen? Uh, P90X. I've been doing that for years. Okay. okay. Um, you're on the uh, Fox board. A most interesting experience with the Murdoch family. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it's not the non-Murdoch moves we've made have been the more interesting ones. Um, Rupert's rolling off the board now. Uh, he's 92. Actually, I'm gonna I'm going to his ranch tomorrow. Um, uh, they're wonderful people. They're they're risk takers and entrepreneurs to the end. Hmm. I love that culture. Uh, there's no cool succession story I can tell you. It's not like the TV show. It really right. isn't. <laughs> so, sorry, uh, that was a boring answer for no, you. No, no, that's good. The fact you're going to his ranch, I'm coming with. Um, <laughs> favorite song to enjoy? Uh, my ringtone is Cashmere. I'm a big Led Zeppelin fan. So, okay. Cashmere is a Led Zeppelin song. Uh, you've done a lot. Outstanding bucket items? Uh, I'm a mountain climber and a bow hunter, so I've, I want to get the big foreign sheep. Some of them are up here in Canada. Um, I like to hunt. And okay. so I'm actually going elk hunting tomorrow um, <laughs> in the Rockies. So I, uh, I'd like to do bow hunting and sheep. There's four breeds of North American sheep. Two of them I want to come here to get. All right, cool, cool. Uh, favorite quote or expression? Favorite what quote? Quote or expression? Uh, I, I'll just do my mom's again. You got two ears and one mouth, use it in that proportion. So I'm going to give you another one so you can't give me the same answer you gave earlier. <laughs> Best advice ever received. Well, that was the best advice I ever received. Let me flip the answer. Okay. I, my, I got three kids in college now, and you know all these quotes. I'm a quote guy. I just tell my college, my kids in college, there's one secret to, to college, one secret to college, and the rest of life: time management. <laughs> just manage your time, and get your priorities straight. Yeah. And and the rest figures itself out. So time management. There, how's that? Beautiful. And I'm gonna ask you for one more: <laughs> key to living a good life. Be honest with yourself and with everybody else. Mr. Paul Ryan, ladies right, and gentlemen. All right.